Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. And we're glad you joined us tonight. Yep. We got a great show planned for you. We're going to talk about cold tolerance tonight. We had a little cool spell come through here, so we're going to talk about which plants are more cold tolerant than others. Uh, have our show and tell segment, and as always, answer some questions some of the viewer questions at the end of the show. And if you have any questions during the show, put those in the comments and we'll be glad to get to them next week. So our average frost state here in zone eight is November 20th. And we're gonna hit it in the morning on the 16th. So that's gonna be pretty doggone close. Last year we was back out in January. So that just goes to show you most of the time it's pretty daggum, uh, Correct. Every now and then you'll, you'll get a little break here, but it's going to hit pretty close this year. You think, I didn't think we were supposed to get quite close enough to a frost. 34. 34? 34. 34. So that, that's a good possibility for frost there. Right, right. Um, so a little early this year, I've seen yeah, some uh, days, yeah. Tom Matthews and some others on the uh, road by road group talking about how they was a little cooler than normal this time mm -hmm. of year. Um, as far as our show and tell goes, Take a look at that right there. Ain't that pretty? Ambrosia corn. Now, it didn't quite fill out all the way to the top there. We run out of hot weather. Yeah, we run out of hot weather. But ain't nothing wrong with that. Now, at the expo there, we didn't have as much time to tend to that as we would in our personal garden. So I did have a few ears out there with worms on them. But uh, ended up making some pretty looking it corn. It was good, too. We actually fried some of them. That was the first fried time. Fried some. Fried. We uh, cut it off the... With a knife, like you cut it off, put some water and flour in there with it, and fried it in hog lard. Now that's got to be good, ain't it? And it was. Yeah, get your cholesterol up a little yeah. bit too, probably. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are only used to growing corn in the spring, and they don't realize you can grow it as long as you don't flirt too much with that first frost date. You can grow it yeah. almost year round. A lot of the commercial farmers, <coughs> corn has become a huge, sweet corn has become a huge commodity around here in the last few years. And a lot of guys, I know this year, did some experiment with some late crops. So yeah, there's a lot going on there. We, we find out we can grow it a lot better and easier and more often than we, we thought we could. That's right. And I had some collards I was gonna show, but the they wilted on me, so I didn't, uh, was a little embarrassed to bring those to yeah. the stage. Yeah. But they, I tell you what, those tiger collards, um, we was talking to a seed rep the other day, and we was talking about, a guy at the expo told us about the bulldog variety, and then they come out with that top bunch too, and uh, the seed rep said he couldn't tell much difference. Well, he said they did a trial up at Tifton, Georgia, where they had all three varieties side by side. He said when they got ready, they carried a couple of their big farmers up there, so they couldn't actually couldn't tell any difference at all, which was kind of amazing to me. But he said they, you could not tell any difference, and, and uh, I couldn't be any more pleased with that tiger. Uh, and that so, bulldog's expensive. It's expensive. I imagine that top bunch too. Yeah. When it does become available, it's going to be pretty pricey too. Right. So that tiger is uh, the way to go, if you ask me. Um, I saw where your cover crops are coming up. Yep, some. cover crops are coming up. I'm still having some issues getting my carrots up. I was a little late planting my carrots. This cold spell coming here, and I think it's going to drag me out a little bit on the germination on it. Although it's been plenty wet, but I did get my, my radishes popped right up, my English peas popped right up. I should have been about two weeks ahead of the ahead of the uh, this cool weather on that. And I could have got them up like you did. I think your weed pressure is one of your big enemies on your uh, carrots yeah. too. Yeah, I do too. Um, so lots of good things going on in the garden. If it ever dry up, we got about two inches of rain last night. We're going to be planting onions as soon as we get them. Yep. And doing several videos on that. We're probably going to do, I'll do a video showing you how I do it. He can do a video showing you how he's, he does it. And both ways work great. Just give you a couple different options there. All right. And let's talk about our tool of the week here. What we got there? Digging tool. So this thing right here, you'll see it called several different names. Some people call it a hoary hoary knife. Um, kind of, I guess it's got its origins in Japan as a gardening tool, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, WW Manufacturing out of Pennsylvania uh, makes this for us, and uh, they call it a, you also see it called a leash digging tool. I don't know where that comes from, but it's a USA made tool. A lot of times the hoary hoary are made over in China, or whatever, because that's where the roots of that tool come right. from. This is USA made, and it's high carbon, 
uh, heat treated, serrated there where you can get in if you got some roots to cut into it. Put it there where you can see it serrated where you got some roots. And then it's got an edge on this side. And it's perfect for, for planting onions, shallots, leeks, anything like that because you can dig your kind of a small hole there. It's got a nylon, nylon sheath there that you put on your belt. So it's a great tool. We sell a lot of them. We like them. Yeah, and um, so it, it works good for putting in transplants all sides. You can put in little onions. You can put in big old four-inch transplants with it. And what I like, as opposed to most of the hoary hoary knives you've seen, it's got this little kind guard. of shield or guard yeah. on it, but that gives you some leverage. <clears throat> you can show enough digging the ground, ain't got to worry about your hands slipping off yep. there. So that's a, you're not going to be in that. That's a high quality tool right there. We call it our digging tool. Yeah, and if you've got uh, a lady friend in your life that likes to work out in a flower bed, just make a heck of a Christmas gift. That's right. All right, so now let's get into the main meat of the show this week where we're going to talk about cold tolerance, which is, uh, you know, quite handy with this cold spell coming through here on the East Coast and talk about which crops are more, more cold tolerant than others. Before we get into that, let's talk about things that make crops more cold tolerant than others relatively. Um, so when you... You can't just really search online and say what this what's the actual temperature that this particular crop can survive because there's a lot of variables at play there. Wind, humidity, a lot of stuff. Yeah. And wind can be a major factor. That's right. Wind can play a big role. Another big role is <clears throat> whether that plant was preconditioned to some cold temperatures. You know, if it's been cold for a few weeks and then you get a little drop there, that plant's going to be able to handle a lot better than if you got a just 20 degree swing. Yeah, right. Um, and we're by no means expert on this because we normally can grow most stuff year round in the wintertime. And our, our friends up north probably have a lot more experience with this. We're going to touch on it as much as we can and we'd love to have some feedback telling you what some of your experiences is with some of these crops we're going to talk about today. That's right. Um, so preconditioning or kind of mm -hmm. having the, the plants hardened off helps and when we go to plant stuff we grow in our greenhouse we always kind of like to leave it outside for yep. a few days before we put it in the ground so it can get used to that cooler weather um another big thing is soil moisture so a lot of people would think that having the soil wet is just going to make everything freeze more easily complete opposite complete opposite so water has a we call a high specific heat, which is kind of a Ooh, property. That's a fancy word. Of water. Just throw it out there. High, spe high specific, specific heat. heat. Yeah. Which means it takes more energy to freeze water than it does a lot of other chemical compounds that are close to water on the periodic. So you don't table. want your plant strap stress when the cold spell comes in. And I learned that firsthand last year. I had some pretty beets up about that tall, and. Um, wasn't wet and we got a little fr frost come in and beets are usually real cold tolerant it, it got them yeah so uh if you keep your soil moist that's going to help out a lot with that also if they're in that very young stage when they first come up they're they're more you're more apt to lose them there if they got a, a good decent root system on them the plants are a little bit larger you seem to have better luck keeping them there too then then that that stage when they first come up it's tough on them. It's tough to keep them. They're real tender, and uh, and that can be a bad. But that's the reason that you want to plant the stuff before you frost it and get it get it established before that cold weather comes in. Yeah, when we talk about overwintering, <clears throat> the whole main strategy behind overwintering, whether it be a cover crop or a, what we call a cash crop, you got to get it up strong enough established so when that frost comes in, it's not going to uh, bother it too mm -hmm. much. Other things you can do, we don't do it down here, but uh, in northern climates, I know it's very valuable, is mulching around stuff like carrots. Um, row covers. Yeah, row covers. Um, I haven't used any row covers, but I have contemplated using some. A lot of the market farmers up north use them a lot. They have to. Yeah. They have to. All right, let's talk about some of these crops. Uh, we're going to start off with what we call the cool weather champs. And these are the ones that can, can take it pretty harsh. Yep. Carrots. Carrots. Now, the, uh, the roots can take it a lot cooler than the tops can. But I've never, even last year when it got down to 17 or so, a few, few days, never saw any 
effect on my carrots. And you actually want some cold on those carrots because that helps them be more sweeter. Give them a flavor. And give them more flavor. Yeah. Beets. Beets are another another cool weather champion. Beets can tolerate it. Just don't let your soil be dry like mine was yeah. last year. But beets do great in uh, cool weather. Um, another one that absolutely loves cool weather are Brussels sprouts. Mm -hmm. You can't grow them in warm weather. No. They want it cold. Um, and you better have plenty of patience when you grow Brussels sprouts. Now they, I love them. They're very good, but man, it takes some things for air. They're worse than carrots. Worse than carrots, yeah. Um, and then the the um, the heavyweight champ of the cool weather champs would be collars. Collars. Collars are rising in popularity. You know, collars have such a bold and complex flavor that a lot of people are doing a lot of experiment with how they how, how they fix them and present them to you know, to eat, and, and they're catching on somewhat. It used to, collars were something poor people eat, and that's what we eat a lot when it's coming up. But nowadays, it's kind of a fancy thing to eat collars, and collars have really caught on popularity in the last few years, similar to kale. Right, well, um, there's a guy named Hugh Atchison, he used to be on a show called Top Chef, which is pretty popular, and he had a restaurant up in Athens, Georgia, when I was at school up there, still does, I'm guessing, and uh, he, he kind of, <clears throat> made a quote a couple of years ago that said collards are the new kale. You know, kale was the, the big thing for a while there. Yeah. And uh, collards have always been popular here in the South. But they've really taken on <coughs> in the they, There's so much more things you can do with them. I, by no means am I a chef or anything. But uh, kale to me, I like kale in certain situations. But collards, you could do so much more with them. But I, just like kale soup, I prefer to have kale in that. But if I'm frying or, or stewing or something like that, I got where I like my collars. And they, some varieties of collars, they say, can take it down to zero degrees. Yep. Um, which is pretty pretty remarkable. Kale's pretty tough, but uh, collards even tougher. So yep. if you live up north and want to have some greens for the winter, collards is going to be your way to go. And parsley. Parsley? Parsley is that plant that's used as a garnish on your plate most of the time. You Little order fish thing. and chips, you get you some. that. You can it's, Everything they always say that it's edible too, and I'm sure it is, uh, but it's most times just used as garnish, but it is very cold hardy. That's right, that's right. And you can put that in soups as well. Mm -hmm. And then we've got spinach, which is real cold hardy. Yeah, and you know, spinach is something we've never grown much here in the South, and I really don't know why I love spinach as in the salad and, you know, and having uh, stewed down or fried down, however, I just love spinach, but we just don't see nobody growing spinach in the South. It's one of those things that we just have not ever grown here. It's kind of a booger to harvest because yeah. it stays so low to the ground. But it's extremely cold hardy. Oh, then folks up north, that's one of their go-tos, the spinach. That's right. And then the, the last one of the cool weather champs, which we haven't grown, but we got some on the way, are leeks. Yep. Uh, supposedly leeks are even more cold hardier than, say, something like onions or shallots. Mm -hmm. They do really good. So, Well, Holly Marsh put a picture of some parsnips on the road by road group the other day. Right. They look like white carrots. They look like white carrots. That's something we've never grown before. Mm -hmm. And that's the great thing about gardens is it's always something new I try. They look real interesting to me. And she said they had a little bit of flavor to them. So that may be something we try in the, in the future. And it's very cold hardy. That's similar right. to carrots. <clears throat> All right, so those are your cool weather champs. Those are gonna those are gonna be your most resilient things you can grow. And unless you got just snow covering the ground uh, most of you should be able to grow some, some of those. Yep. You might have to use a little row cover mulch, but um, sh most people should be able to grow those. Now let's talk about these moderately frost tolerant ones. Um, we're not gonna focus on things that aren't frost tolerant because we'll uh, assume that's fairly common knowledge. But this stuff that's moderately frost tolerant are crops that they get a little frost kiss on them. It might burn the tips of them a little bit, but it's not gonna kill them. Right. Um, and, and usually these can take temperatures in a range of about 25 to 32 degrees, something like that. It gets much lower than that, it might tear them up pretty good. Um, so the first one of those would be broccoli and cauliflower, of which I have some getting close to getting ready now. Um, they can take it pretty good except when they start making the heads. If those heads, the cauliflower heads or the broccoli head, get frost on them, they're done they get all spongy yep so those are the situations where i might consider using some row cover if 
I knew I was getting a frost and these things were almost ready to harvest. Let's put something over it to protect them a little bit. Other ones we got, uh, cabbage. Cabbage can almost go in that other category. It can stand a lot of cold. <laughs> If it gets down real, real cold and stays there for a prolonged period of time, it will split the head or bust the head of it. But it's pretty doggone cold hardy. You need to have it pretty much made by the time the cold gets in. You won't get a lot of growth out of it in cold weather. But uh, <clears throat> it's pretty cold hardy. And then uh, we got lettuce. Yep. Which it'll burn the lettuce a little, a little bit. bit. Yeah. But it's still, still plenty good to eat. Onions. Uh, onions are plenty cold hardy. Shallots as well. Uh, cilantro, which you've got yep. some planted, yep. um, which is a great addition to any kind of taco or something like that. Chard, which is in there kind of the same family as beets. Man, that chard's tough stuff. We grew some of the Expo. It's the most insect-resistant green that I know of. Yeah, for whatever reason, they don't nibble on it like they do the other stuff. Um, mustard greens. Yeah, mustard to get burnt back. Must get burnt back a little bit. But they're worth growing because they are so good. They're so good and easy to grow. Yep. Um, and then you got radishes. They'll get burnt back a little bit. And turnips will too. Yep. But usually the roots on them are still pretty yeah. good yep. after a good little frost. So hopefully that gives you an idea of, of where your ranges are, what you can try to pull off there. Um, if, you, if you ever have a chance to build you a high tunnel, that's a great investment where you can grow food year-round. Don't have to worry about the yep. frost. Where's our koozie? We don't have a, we're not giving away oh, a koozie. Oh, we're not giving this away way. a koozie, we're giving away a boot. We're going to give away a this winter harvest handbook. So we answer your question, which we're about to get to a couple. Send us an email to cussserve at hostels.com. We'll send you Elliot Coleman's book here. It talks about growing food in the winter and colder months. A nice little yeah, resource. Elliot's kind of a buddy of ours. Whenever we run into one another, we like to have a good talk, catch up on things. And he's a great guy, and he is a wealth of information, especially on growing things in the wintertime. That's right, because he's up there in Maine, and yep. uh, he has to deal with a good part of the year. All right, so if you, uh, you know, send us your questions, and we'll answer them next week. The questions we've got this week, the first one we got is from Anna Cooley, and... Uh, She's already planted her onions, so she planted some yellow granites or some Vidalia onions. And the green growth was so tall, uh, and she was about to get a frost, and her neighbor told her that she ought to trim the tops off of them. Them dead gum neighbors. They caused a lot of problems. <laughs> and she wanted to know if, if that was all right to do. Yeah, but she planted them at the right time. I thought she was dead on when planted. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I have never cut my tops back for that reason. Your tops have a lot of reasons for them being there. They store a lot of nutrients there. They, they do a lot of stuff. Where the photosynthesis yeah, takes I mean, place. Why, why do you want to cut them off? If they do come a hard, hard freeze and you get some burn, you're a lot better off letting them burn than you are to whack them off. You're just going to stress that plant. I can't see where that would be worthwhile. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> don't always listen to your neighbor. Yeah, and I, on the flip side, I wouldn't dig them up either. No, I mean, leave them there be all right. and, and let them come back. They may be delayed a little bit, but leave them there and let them come back and make the best out of it. But learn your lesson and watch what the neighbors tell you. <laughs> That's right. And then our uh, last question is from Tim Jones, and he wants to know, is this also, we was talking about planting onions this time of year, he wants to know, is this also the time of year to plant shallots? AKA green onions, AKA spring onions that are also good in soups. Now I think there might be a little confusion here. What we call green onions is or just spring onions. It's just a smaller version of a regular onion. Right. right. Uh, shallots is a little different ball game, but very similar. Growth they shallots, are in the onion family. They are in the onion family. So you would treat them real similar to what you would an onion. If you're up north, I would treat them like I would garlic. We we can't hardly grow garlic here in the south. I would treat them just like I would onions. In the south, and if I got it more north, I treat them real similar to garlic. That's right. So, and you don't have to grow shallots to have green onions. No, no. You can pull your little small ones there in a couple months right. and have those for your soup. So, thank y'all for your questions. And um, a little teaser we have got a completely new product line cool. coming. Uh, I won't tell you what it is, but it's something we haven't carried before. Uh, and we've got a whole new line of products that we're about to carry in. But I want you all to try to guess what it is. So put down in the comments what you think this new product line we're coming out with uh, that we'll be carrying. Yeah, it's something everybody can use. 
It's something everybody can use, something everybody needs if they're going to garden. Um, so take a few guesses of what that is, and we'll see if anybody gets it right, and we'll be glad to tell you what that is on next week's show. And we'll see you then. Have a good one.